Welcome. I'm Esther Allen, a professor at City University of New York, and here with me is Allison Markin-Powell, who translates Japanese literature and works with the Penn Translation Committee. She and I are co-organizers of Translating the Future, the conference you are now attending. Thank you, Esther, and thank you all for joining us for the final event in our Tuesday conversation series, week 20. Today, we'll be hearing from two luminary writers and translators about their works in progress and how they make progress in our uncertain present, guided in a discussion about the elusive art of translation by a brilliant moderator. Kate Briggs is the author of This Little Art and is currently working on a book titled The Long Form, which finds a philosophy of the novel in the daily lives of a new mother and her baby. Tracy K. Smith is the author of four collections of poetry and a memoir, and her collaboration with Ching Tai Bi on the translation of the poems of Ile, My Name Will Grow Wide Like a Tree, will be published in November. Magdalena Edwards is a writer, actor, and translator from Spanish and Portuguese. She has translated a long list of authors, and her own work has appeared in an even longer list of publications. You can read their full and fascinating bios on the Center for the Humanities site. We'd like to express our gratitude to the sponsor of today's event, the Princeton University Program in Translation and Intercultural Communication. Before we start talking about the art of translation, we'd like to take one more moment to remember the dangers of translation and to salute the work of Red Tea, the first and only nonprofit that exclusively advocates for translators and interpreters in high-risk settings worldwide, including war zones, detention centers, and sites of political unrest where translators and interpreters are persecuted, imprisoned, abducted, and assassinated with impunity. Founded by Maya Hess, who I'm proud to say received her PhD from City University of New York, Red Tea has spearheaded the Open Letter Project, which alongside partners such as Penn International, advocates for better asylum policies for combat linguists. Red Tea has also issued the first guide for translators and interpreters in conflict zones. It drafts expert opinions for court cases involving translators and interpreters, and it connects individual translators and interpreters with resources to get them out of harm's way. To learn more about Red Tea's work and to support it, you can visit red-t.org. Translating the Future will culminate this week with several marquee events on our original conference dates. Beginning tomorrow, Wednesday, with a double billing of Postmodernlingual New York, exploring how the city's immigrant communities have always enriched its linguistic texture, and Translating for a World on Fire, featuring Maria Davana Headley and Emily Wilson, authors of new translations of Beowulf and the Odyssey, respectively. That will be followed Thursday by an exploration of democracy and translation with Natalie Diaz, Ken Liu, and Marilyn Nelson. And our final finale event on Friday, a flight of Tokarczuk translators will feature 12 of Nobel laureate Olga Tokarczuk's translators from around the world, moderated by Susan Harris of Words Without Borders. You can register now for all of those events on the Center for the Humanities website. Translating the Future is convened by PEN America's Translation Committee, which advocates on behalf of literary translators, working to foster a wider understanding of their art and offering professional resources for translators, publishers, critics, bloggers, and others with an interest in international literature. The committee is currently co-chaired by Lynn miller Lockman and Larissa Kaiser. For more information, look for translation resources at pen.org. Please keep in mind, as usual, that you can email your questions for today's speakers, Tracy, Kate, and Magdalena, to translatingthefuture2020 at gmail.com. We'll keep questions anonymous unless you note in your email that you would like us to read your name. If you know anyone who is unable to join us for today's live stream or any of those we've done for the last 19 weeks, Recordings are available on the HowlRound and Center for the Humanities sites, as well as in the Penn Archive. Before we turn it over to Tracy, Kate, and Magdalena, we'd like to offer our utmost and eternal gratitude 
to our partners at the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center, CUNY, the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Kalman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, PEN America, and the Masters of Dark Zoom Magic at HowlRound, who make this live stream possible. And now, over to you three. Hello, Tracy and Kate. And thank you also to Allison and to Esther and to all of the partners and supporters of this incredible series. Um, I wanna jump right in to our conversation, beginning with um, a question about the title of today's event. Mm -hmm. And Tracy, I'd like to begin with you and I'd like to know, what do you find most elusive about translation as a practice and what for you is most concrete? Mm. I love the question, um, which is in some ways itself elusive to me. Um, I feel like every, um, every poem that I've set out to translate has been um, kind of a new initiation into this art form for me. Um, Elay's work is the first work that I've really dedicated myself to, to bringing into English and it's from a language that I don't myself speak. So the many different um, modes of listening and collaborating um, have changed this um, from what I might have imagined it, it, it otherwise could have been. Um, I think that finding the road into a text is the elusive thing. Um, Sometimes I feel that it's a visceral connection. Sometimes for me with these poems that I first encountered in a very like rudimentary um, English form, it was trying to get past the, the language to a, a sense of the images or the, the impulses that set them into motion. And that always felt to me like a kind of dance and a kind of like a prayer almost to be a receptive medium for another person's um, voice and thoughts. Um, and those are the things that have also been so exhilarating to me. I, I, I find that the poems that were hardest for me to find my way into um, often were the ones that taught me the most about what I was seeking to do because I had to play these different kinds of very concrete games. Like, okay, I'm having a difficult time um, stepping into the thought process of this poem. So I'm, I'm going to translate it backwards and see if the images um, can guide me until I forget that I'm attempting to do something and then I'm just in conversation with this. Um, and I love the fact that every time I opened up this document with Elay's poems, I had no idea what the approach or the, you know, the dance would be like. Um, yeah. Kate, what, what would you say for you is elusive um, and what's concrete? Yeah, thank you. Really, it's, it's beautiful to hear Tracy talk about that process. I think for me, if I'm honest, when I first saw the title, actually, The Elusive Art of Translation, I think part of me was kind of resistant to it, thinking not, not elusive, you know, not in, in not at least not in the sense of something that's kind of hard to reach or hard to get at or, or that requires some special process of initiation in order to, to begin. I was thinking something more like the concrete, Tracy spoke of concrete games, you know, the concrete art of translation or the embodied art of translation or the laborious art of translation. I, I think in, um, in the book, This Little Art, one of the ambitions was really to try and bring the practice into relation with ordinary everyday experiences of life and kind of try to show uh, how translation happens in such kind of settings, embodied kind of pressured settings. So with that kind of ambition in mind, I would, I would say no to elusive. And then I was thinking about this and, and, and then thinking about what it feels like uh, at my desk uh, recently, trying to translate a sentence, you know, a three word sentence um, from French to English and, and understanding it, feeling kind of fairly confident that I've understood it um, and feeling like it's making me feel something, you know, feeling, get, having a sense of its charge or its energy uh, and feeling, uh, sensing that there are probably maybe sort of two or three possible solutions available to me. And I set them down, I set one down, I delete it, I put another down, I 
and delete it. I set another one down. <laughs> and and there, you know, trying to trying there to catch at something. And there it feels like elusive would be exactly the right term. This this idea of kind of you know that you can hear something or that, that you can feel something or there's a charge of something. Um, but how what do you have how what kind of net <laughs> can you make? Can you construct that can actually hold that? And I think for me that often I realize that it can't happen at the level of the sentence actually it's always about then how that sentence is is acting in relation to another sentence somewhere else or another word set choice somewhere else it's about kind of sort of slowly weaving this much bigger net that might catch something of that um of of, of what i think i hear so there so i would say no to elusive and then and then and then a yes <laughs> and a, a kind of emphatic yes to elusive I mean, it, it, it sounds like it, in an interesting way, what each of you is getting at is um, there's no one path uh, each time that's the same, or even for, for one text, if it's a, say it's a novel uh, or, or a series of, of chapters or lectures or poems, each one is gonna demand different things. And I love this idea of starting backwards. And also this, Tracy, you're talking about this kind of wanting it to feel not like it's you're trying very hard to make it work, but rather to have the, the feeling of, the, of, of, of this piece of art or language that, that is meant to have the reader have an experience. Uh, uh, and I like the resistance to the word elusive as well. Yeah, I feel like it's also in some way, at least for me, um, a dance around my relationship to authority. Mm. Um, you know, okay, I don't have authorial authority um, I don't have a command of the language. And so can I, when do I allow myself to trust that what I'm receiving from this poem in the form that I'm getting it is something I should be authorized to um, act upon and to, to kind of offer as the one of the central um, concerns or one of the central offerings of the, of the experience of the poem. Um, and that's an interesting, you know, set of questions and inhibitions that I think ideally you work, uh, work through and they become less and less of a constraint um, uh, the further into a poem that you get. But um, I, I often found myself saying, okay, this is what these poems are saying to me. And I feel so um, compelled by these, these facets and these, these powers that the poem seems to embody but I really hope that somebody else will hear something else and act upon that and and do the work of translating this in a different way and somehow that was very um, freeing for me um, to think I wasn't going to be I wasn't going to be the last person I'm not the first person and what I can offer is um, a version of my own conversation with this poet yes yes um, so I've really enjoyed reading uh, each of your works uh, as in preparation for this and sort of thinking about uh, poems, Tracy, that you've written uh, and also uh, Kate from This Little Art reading, you know, your meditations on translation and on language and on various things. And so I wanted to read a little snippet from, from each of you and sort of throw that into this conversation, see where that might take us. Um, and so the, the first one, and I think it, it, these connect also with these questions of body and dance and a kind of giving and taking. Um, the first one is from, uh, is from Kate, is from Kate's book, This Little Art. And I, I, I just love this moment uh, where you say, I read with my body. I read and move to translate with my body and my body is not the same as yours. Um, and, and Tracy, the, the section I chose uh, is um, to, to read of your work. It comes from the poem Self-Portrait as the letter Y, uh, which is such an interesting title, so evocative for me. Self-Portrait is something that's different perhaps than the speaker herself. And it comes from the book, The Body's Question. Uh, and the section is this, I am invisible here like I like it. The language you taught me rolls from your mouth into mine, the way kids will pass smoke between them. You feed it to me until my heart grows fat. I feed you tiny black eggs. I feed you my very own soft truth. And this, this, this scene and this image and this exchange makes me think in a lot of ways about translation, perhaps as, as something that is, that is not only exchanged, but also um, perhaps even um, can, be, can be erotic. And, and this then brings me, Tracy, to this translation project that you 
that you've been working on that comes out in November. So I just want to throw that all in and see <laughs> where that will take us. Yeah. Uh, I get well. I, I guess um, to begin with, the the, the sentences that you, that you read, Magdalena, and uh, what I had in mind there is um, what I have in mind, or who the work I have in mind, kind of ongoingly throughout this little art or the lecture courses, Colin Bart's lecture courses, and and there, kind of distantly, I think, or maybe not so distantly, and maybe a few pages away from those lines, I've um, written about a list uh, that made in his autobiography of sorts, translated by Richard Howard, which is just a simple list, apparently simple list of, of likes and dislikes. Um, I like, he says, I like cinnamon. I like uh, slow walks. I like uh, very cold beer. I dislike women in trousers, harpsichords, uh, the afternoon, you know, this kind of, and so he has this list, it's very quite well-known list. Um, of preferences, of tastes, I guess, and the, and that um, those two paragraphs end uh, with him writing. Um, you know, what does this mean? What does that want to say? You know, actually, it means nothing, or it's it's it, it has no significance apart from to say my body is not is different from yours. You know, my body is not the same as yours. Um, so I was just very caught by this kind of expression of of preference, um, which might seem like the smallest things. You know, the smallest like cold beer rather than whatever, you know, cold cider or something, you know, it's the smallest preferences, but to think about um, making a kind of space for translation where, where or an, an account of translation where those sorts of preferences um, are kind of possible to affirm and to, to hold to, and perhaps even Tracy was talking about authority to kind of ground an authority in. Um, but at the same time, you know, thinking about, uh, one's preferences, you know, for like blue jumpers or whatever it might be, um, or lipstick or, um, you know, I think thinking, thinking that is that it, one doesn't stop. I don't think it's possible to kind of, or one should sort of stop there with an affirmation of, of, of preference. Uh, it seems that, that to me that it also kind of opens up a space of inquiry where we might start think of, thinking, well, certainly when you're translating to think about why do I prefer it? this way rather than that way, you know? Why do I like it like this? Why, um, especially when it comes to language and the use of language, why does this sound right and good to me? And how far can I affirm that that is a kind of individuated preference and how far am I kind of reproducing some kind of norm that I might have um, inherited or received? So it also, I think translation does bring you up against your your preferences, like not harpsichords, you know, <laughs> um, or your your kind of received aesthetic aesthetics of, of, of a sentence of a line, um, in really really interesting and challenging ways, and that's one of the reasons why it's so, I think, valuable to do it. So, again, it's sort of have, wanting to say both to affirm the bodily and, and the fact that bodies are different, and we do translate, you know, from our bodies, and we are under different pressures and that, and, and and kind of oriented in different ways, but at the same time, sort of think out why and how that might be and how they might change possibly through the process of, the do of doing it. Mm, I love that. I love that sense that, you know, we can begin with what we're drawn to, what speaks to us in the, the language, be it, you know, made up of any essence that is home for us. But then that other thing that you're talking about, which is, okay, now I've, I, I need to also acknowledge what I'm drawn to and think about what the other facets of this work are calling me to submit to, to learn, to seek mm -hmm. to, um, to love or question in different ways. I felt that a lot. Um, there are aspects of Ile's work that speak to me so emphatically and they have to do with theme and they have to do with a beautiful sense of image. And the features that were, I had to kind of submit to were the ones that had to do with um, what sometimes feels oracular or what sometimes feels, you know, like it's built of an emphatic repetitive insistence. Um, and I, I think it was a really beautiful revelation to say, I, I need to take myself out of this work more. I need to, to recognize, okay, this is what the me that, that loves certain things can do within this space. But then I also have to remember to take some of that out and honor these other, these other facets of the work, which is beautiful. I think That's, it kind of speaks to the, 
the sense that I'm I um here in the the lines that you quote from my poem, um, which is this is an act of love in a way. This is an act of of finding um, a shared language um, for really heightening proximity uh, or porousness between two people. Um, and that's really uh, an exciting thing to do as a writer because most of what I find myself doing is, is about going into myself, is about thinking in you know, very solitary terms, hoping that psychically I can make a connection to something better or bigger than me or buried deep within me. But um, it's a very different thing to say, no, I wanna be uh, a conduit for someone else. And that's kind of what, what love uh, invites us to do in different ways. I certainly felt myself, um, you know, actually literally falling in love with the person that, whose work I was translating and, and having the f good fortune of being able to, to talk with her, albeit in this triangulated way. Um, and to, to, I hope, take something from her that lives in my poetry now, you know? Yes, yes. And, and everything that you say also really resonates for me with what you brought up before about uh, pushing against uh, authority and, and maybe not having this authorial or, or authority kind of position. At the same time, what Kate was also speaking about is choice and you know choosing to prefer it this way, feel through it that way, and to have that generosity um, also, as you were describing, to take yourself out of it more. I'm in it too much myself. And I wonder if, um, if Ile herself, if you feel that in her poems, that speaker is also doing that kind of gesture of taking herself out in certain moments. Um, and, and the other question I wanted to ask you about your experience of translating her work is, what was it like to work with the, the co-translator? Mm -hmm. and, and also, how did you feel, because I was reading a little bit about um, your meeting her for the first time in New York City and then having this opportunity to go visit her, you know, on her turf. And how, and how, how was that sort of comparative or experience or duet even of, of, of interlocution? Oh yeah, I mean, so many different, uh, like the geometry of the relationship is really interesting. Um, the way that we worked together because Ile had hardly any English and I, I don't speak Chinese at all was through, you know, Cheng Tai Bi who goes by David. Um, and so I found myself working from this, um, this kind of bare bones, uh, literal translation and the bearer, the better, because there were moments when um, he brought in a kind of lilt or something that he thought was beautiful. And so it, it occluded something that I needed to be able to hear. Mm -hmm. um, so that negotiation was interesting. Um, but then to see him take my poem and back translate it for her um, so she could witness the changes that I had made. Um, some of them had to do with image systems that I thought could better carry a sense in English. Um, and, and so it, it became a, it truly did feel like a collaboration. Um, there were things that she liked about the changes and there were moments when she said, you've pulled this, you're, you're only listening to this layer of my poem. You're only listening to the layer of this poem that has to do with desire or with like female sexual power this is a poem that's also about government, or this is a poem that's also about authoritarian, you know, law. I need you to hear both of these things. And, and so to, to be guided to kind of think about the distribution of, of my awareness within a poem was really exciting. And to know that it wasn't threatening to her to see what I chose and what I, what I didn't necessarily recognize, but rather an invitation to kind of educate me about these poems. Um, that was really delightful as it was delightful seeing her, um, her grow into her fuller self when we were in Beijing and she was leading me around and um, introducing me to the people that were her peers and, and protégés and um, eating together, all of the things that kind of, you know, we, we build, a, you know, talking about the things we like um, and how they, they are so emblematic of what we have to say and how being able to share in that together was um, really wonderful. It would be fascinating also to see those various drafts and, and that exchange and that dance, you know, uh, I mean, that's where I wish I spoke more languages 
because of course mm -hmm. I could never appreciate the Chinese original or the translation back from yours. But but if one could get a sense of all of that, and then and then of course it's all layered in the final translation. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Kate, I wanted to ask you about your new project, uh, which I I've sort of thinking a little, I've been thinking a little bit about as a duet of sorts between a, a new kind of translation work you were describing. Uh, from the French, right? And mm -hmm. then working um, on an, a novel of your own. And so can you tell us a little bit about this, um, these two, these two things? I, that you're yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I have a lot, yeah, thinking also I mean, everything that was just said, um, maybe it does connect. I think it does connect um, the sense that I didn't, my the sort of um, most formative translation experience um, so far has been with an, an author with whom I, I had a very strong sense of working with and writing with, especially at the level of the translation, but also at the level of writing this little art, being a kind of making a kind of um, space of, of of writing and thinking with uh, in that book. But but where the the dynamic or the reciprocity was not um, was not as Tracy describes in in, in her situation um, for for many reasons to do with you know being alive or dead in one thing, but also um, to do with a kind of canonical established um, um, philosopher, writer, figure, and, and being a kind of uh, very enthused, uh, uh, willing student of that work, but with, with a very kind of um, uncertain sense of, of her own identity. We're talking about myself <laughs> uh, as, a, as, a, as a writer, as a thinker, as a, um, so where it felt like the kind of distribution of, of, um, of the distrib the distrib distrib distribution, I guess, of, 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 of power or agency or, or, or was, was, was just was different, different to what um, I think Tracy's describing as, as having experienced. And, um, and in a way that connects, I think in this little art, there's one point um, towards the end of the book where I talk about um, trying, I try to make an analogy again, sort of bringing translation in relation to the ordinary, um, everyday, very common experiences between uh, translation and childcare. Um, and the, the, the hinge of that analogy is, is the, is the, the reality, what for me felt like the reality of, of taking responsibility for something that I couldn't expect to be responsible for me. So a kind of asymmetrical, kind of one directional responsibility that you might have with a, with a baby. You know, I'm responsible for you, um, you're not responsible for me. I know that sounds slightly unlikely to kind of um, put uh, Holland Bart's uh, late work in the position of the baby in that scenario, but it felt <laughs> there is a sense. Uh, and I really don't know, uh, uh, yeah, we're, yeah, anyway, we could talk about whether or not he would be in any way interested in that. But for me, that sense of like, I'm speaking for you, I'm not expecting you to speak for me. That's kind of not possible. It's not reversible in that way. And that connects, I guess, to this, this well, very much an, uh, uh, for me to this, this, um, this project, which is, I keep calling it new, but it's been sort of three years or so now, which is, a, which is an effort to try and think um, through fiction, um, the kind of fictional days of, of living out, uh, living out and living with the, the, the unproductive, sort of unpredictable, needy, um, uh, open form of a baby, uh, with that kind of long form of kind of discontinuous continuity and demand and response that that produces in the kind of the, at the level of the sort of texture of the days, and to try and think that um, together with the kind of capacious, oddly interruptive long form of the novel, which I know when I say it like that, it sounds kind of completely opaque even to me, writing it like what that actually might, might look like. But the, I, I, the effort is to try and um, hold this sort of novelistic storytelling element um, together or kind of hold it in relation to a more essayistic kind of uh, philosophical element of thinking out what, what kind of thing a novel is. Um, and in relation to that, I have been translating, um, and I've been working just, but, but very uh, in a very un um, uh, uncontracted kind of personal uh, uh, way through preference, actually, and through learning, which is uh, a term that Tracy used, um, a novel by Hélène Besset, uh, which was written in 1954, called Matana, which is set in a uh, in a maternelle, and it's kind of a, an experimental novel of early years childcare in a way. Um, mm -hmm. And it's extraordinary, I find it extraordinary. It's very strange, but very exciting at the level of um, 
of the page and spacing and line breaking and capitalization and things that I'm trying to do in my own book and then kind of um, found uh, this 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 uh, what is she a kind of instructor in a way um, so I've been working on on, uh, on on translating that alongside or just quite quite recently alongside my own projects as a kind of um, learning experience yeah I think this idea that uh, the translation is something that we are responsible for, but it's not responsible for us, is so very interesting. And um, also, uh, I really appreciate how you you get into questions of of childcare and caretaking in this little art, uh, in in you know in a very real way. Um, and that that brings me to a question I think uh, for so many people right now. Uh, during this pandemic, during this time of, of all kinds of upheaval. And, you know, the three of us have have young children who are home all the time. They never leave. <laughs> how, how are you? How are the two of you possibly keeping going with your work? And, and, I, and I mean the most kind, the most uh, specific kind of concrete, you know, techniques or, or, or hacks. And, and even if there's spiritual mantras or something that was working for you, and I'm asking not for a friend, I'm asking for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it's been such an interesting, you know, I can't even, it's like more than a season now, this, this year really. Um, and I've gone like everybody, I think through many stages of feeling overwhelmed, feeling angry, feeling um, just dominated by reality. Um, to feeling, okay, actually the chaos of family 24 seven, everything in one space, maybe I can try and enjoy this. Um, and one of the things that has kind of been helpful for my work, which I didn't have any, you know, impression that I would be able to, to attend to was um, I, I guess really just creating a practice of meditation. Um, you know, my, the, the world, questions of, you know, public health, questions of justice, anxiety of leadership, all of this stuff is, is truly maddening. Um, it changes the way that we relate to people that we know, that we've known for a long time, which is also a, a form of, of, you know, like just burden. Um, and so the meditation for me has been really useful just to turn the volume down, but it's also guided me to start thinking about where my work, my own work might seek to come from in a different way. And in some ways, maybe it's similar to what happens when you're listening to another writer's voice and trying to draw what is true from it in service of that voice. This feels like I'm, I'm trying to listen to the deep me or whatever I believe that I'm, I'm attuned to and to draw something that can feel useful or even necessary to this moment. Um, and that's felt really um, like such a, such a gift to have to find poems um, out of this, this time, to find that my uh, obsession with the news, which many of us have, can actually yield a body of poetry that is, is speaking back to or, or seeking to speak through some of this um, found language. Um, and I feel like there's a big lesson in all of this, which is, um, you know, we just, mothers are really good at making space, but actually we humans can be even better at doing that than we already um, have, have learned to be. Um, and I think it, it, it's about finding for me, a, a opportunity for silence and patience because you can't just sit right down and then get insight. <laughs> Sometimes you have to fight against yourself in order to wait for it um, and to parse it. And that's, um, that happens sometimes when I'm, I'm sitting and writing, but to imagine that that can precede the act of writing, that's very different for me. Um, and then I can go back to picking up Legos and <laughs> trying to get my kids back on the Zoom classroom and, and doing all the things that, um, that family life um, allows us to do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, hmm, <laughs> I feel like in a way I, yeah, I mean, it's a very big question of how I, I feel I think I feel surprised in a way I've been wondering at why why it is that I have 
felt it possible to kind of work ongoing or kind of just sort of keep a sort of sense of um, belief in a project or investment in a project through this through this time like why why when I know for and I don't think it's any sort of particular special quality in me because I know you know many um many friends and you know have felt um have found that really difficult to just find the, the kind of relevance in in you know in relation to all of the, these things that we're, that we're experiencing um I think uh I think I mean in terms of a kind of practical um sort of organization of my day one thing I did do when uh, my children were um lockdown began was just started to just claim um two hours in the morning like I get up earlier earlier than, than anyone else and uh, it was also sort of spring and you know the light was changing and I just come come up to the space I work in and, and have two hours before going back into the into the tangly kind of legoy sort of day and uh doing that um felt just really important for my own kind of well-being um, and just just doing a small push at, at, at work which often meant just reading and just being with um, with the the kind of books that I've set around this project and that I'm thinking with and I guess I think maybe that um, what hasn't happened yet and I think if it did happen I would think I would be in, in, in kind of serious sort of existential crisis but I mean serious in the sense that it's something that I that has held me as a kind of um, one thing I'm trying to think about in this book, the long form is, is of the book as a kind of holding device. And that's also a way of connecting it to, to holding in a, in a kind of Winnicottian sense of, of what it, holding a child or kind of responsive holding. And, and uh, books do, they have always for whatever reason to do with preference or luck or education or privilege or um, sort of held me. And I, and I do believe I haven't lost faith in in the technology of the book as as a as offering a space that I can enter and just live in common with with someone else's energy and time and imagination for a while. Um, and it, not that that kind of takes me out entirely from from my own life or my own reality because I'm always being kind of pulled back into it. And uh, but but I believe in you know, believe in their capacity to do that. So so sort of writing books. Um, even though it takes seems to take me quite a while, it does feel like an ongoingly meaningful thing to do. Just in in and I I, I measure that um, against how how much they they mean to me in times you know like this of uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that idea of the of the book or the poem as a as a space you can enter into which of course suggests you're going to leave where you are mm -hmm. and and the freeingness of that and kind of re, re becoming reacquainted with the power really for, i've been reading a lot i've been writing a little bit less lately but i've been reading a lot and it's been so satisfying to read in a way that that i recall from when i was like a kid right like the summer there's nothing happening you're kind of bored your parents won't take you anywhere you're just in the back of the house or the garage or whatever just reading 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 um and i was hoping that that perhaps each of you might want to read something for us today before we take questions from uh from listeners sure um i'll share i can i'd love to share a poem of elay um hearing you talk kate it also reminds me of something like none of us had guilt <laughs> in this the context of that which is sometimes what the motherhood um, slash being the, the selfish writer makes me feel. And I think there's something about this time that has absolved us of a lot of the unnecessary guilt that we felt, um, maybe because things have collapsed and we've, um, we've been able to kind of just dwell in what, what is beautiful about going to this place, thinking about books, thinking about voices, listening. Um, maybe I'll read... Um, a poem that is, um, well, I'm gonna read this poem, which is a little bit, it feels a little bit unusual for Elay. Um, it's called Black Hair. Um, and I'm reading it because it, it's one of many examples of how something that arises out of her life or her you know, vocabulary of experience or awareness intersected with mine from a very, coming from a very different direction. When I saw a poem called Black Hair as a black woman, that meant so many things to me that I knew it did not mean to Elay. And yet the act of translating the poem allowed those different sets of concerns to kind of play together, which I really loved. Black Hair. 
Black hair like youth runs wild in March. Dark papery leaves fly, teeming, swarming, bum rushing March. Black hair in March is gentle, strangers eyes softer. Memory, a feast on offer. Youth, born of the primordial sea, embrace me. Drape my skin, old as clouds, in something suppler. Black hair blown free, rootless, wanders the desert's countless tombs, sways across a vacant sky, whips at fresh mud in rain. Days blaze past. I have lost sight of my own black hair in the mirror. Let me watch it now for the next thousand years. Black hair weedy in dirt poor soil, thirsty, deluded, squandering its spoils. Black hair has no idea. The story of black hair is my story. When I die, let me drift like a dandelion of black hair. Black hair like holy water. No way, there is no way to be saved except to die. When black hair cries, its tears snuff themselves out like candles. So will my life cease to flicker. Black hair, exhausted brush fire, fanned by misery, whistling through the last century. Black hair, shredded black flag of a woman's glory, ragged and battered in March wind, forsaking dignity, absolved of chastity, with its pride in knots, black hair smiles easily in March. If waterfall, it will plummet. If cloud, it will scatter. Eyes plaintive, wide. Black hair waits to be spun by hardened hands into rock. Thank you, Tracy. That was extraordinary. I think for me that that um, well, there's obviously so many things to think about and to say in relation to that. But I was as a, listening to you kind of pronounce those words with your body and um, and you know occupy the eye of the of the poem in, in at least in the moment of that reading. It just really makes me think of the, of the way that um, translation is you know can in in the best case scenario is not a is not a layering you know it's it's a setting alongside. It's so, so something that, that exists and still permanently exists. And here is something new that exists that, that is in, in, in direct um, conversational, um, affective relation to, to what caused it, what prompted it, and what it couldn't exist without. But they're now two things and they're, and they're conversing. And, and, uh, and what you said about, about the kind of resonance of, of, of hair, black hair, just, just, that just came across really powerfully. Um, and also, not they're conversing, but they're also creating a kind of space in between them, kind of charge in between them. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. It's exciting to me. And I also feel like, oh, I, I under, I've understood so many ways that translation is, you know, it's, it's a creative act. It's a, an act of, of excavation. It's an act of like honoring and archiving. And it's a, an act, a political act in many ways. But this felt like at this, you know, at this time, creating a space for communion, um, love that exists between, you know, unlikely, unlikely pairs seems so important. Um, that, that made me feel very excited to think, oh, um, we can see one another uh, in ways that we, we may never have thought were possible. And that's, that's another really good reason to, um, to cross these lines and to, to undertake this, this kind of conversation in a way. No, I really like that. that unlikely pairing, uh, yeah, likely and unlikely pairings. Um, and also, I think maybe in this in this time, going back to, um, and I'm saying this because I haven't prepared anything to read. <laughs> um, so um, I'm, I'm not just filling that time, but also because, uh, um, uh, well, just because these this um, everything just feels very fragile and a sort of a, at the moment um, mm -hmm. not quite readable um, in this in this in this format. But um, just going back to, to what Magdalena picked up on about that question of, of, of preferences or um, my body's not the same as yours. I think there's also 
and you know I, I do believe that it's important to think through why we might turn our attention to this rather than that what is it that makes us lean towards this rather than that and prefer this rather than that I do think that's that's vital work and that's part of what I think translation asks of us but I also think it's so important maybe right now as well, to be able to affirm your own, your right to your own preferences as well, to say, you know, this is how, this is what I like to do, you know, this is, this is how I like to organize my day in these open days of, you know, non-time and uh, to say this small thing, I like this, <laughs> I hold yeah. to it. Um, so yeah, the right to one's own preferences feels really important. And Kate, Kate, you had mentioned um, that uh, well, now you said the word fragility, which I think is so uh, important, you know, to not be ready to, to share, but to also enjoy for yourself that fragility. And you had mentioned that this new project of translation is a kind of improvised translation. So I wanted to ask you to say just a little bit about that. Like, what, what do you mean by improvised? And what is, the, what is the preference or the pleasure or the joy that might come from that? Um. Thank you. Yeah, I said that in an, e in an email exchange with you, and I, I love that you use it as a as part of your own practice. And I think your own in, your own interests and investments, you kind of you zoomed in on that. And I think I was thinking, what did I mean? And I I I guess I mean uh, improvisation in the sense of without preparation, which feels um, in many ways like the wrong way to start a translation. That one ought to be prepared, and one ought to be qualified, and one ought to be learned enough to undertake this. But I guess. And, I, and that's part of the um, of the invitation I was hoping to make with this little art is to say um, within the sphere of at the moment my own interests. Of course, you know when it becomes a question of publishing and making public, there are many other factors to to consider. But um, at the moment, um, I'm just going to begin. You know, I see this page and I see this um, weird typography and this spacing and and this matter now, uh, which were the you know <laughs> this 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 early years uh, scenes that are being uh, created uh, for me on the page, and I'm just going to start and then and see what that does, and then and trust also in the way the process of translation will lead me towards what I then need to learn and be responsible for. It doesn't absolve me. Starting doesn't absolve me of responsibility. It just leads me towards what I then need to think about, about reading more of her work, reading her biography, thinking about her manifesto, um, you know, and so on and so forth. So that's, I guess, what I mean is just, again, like affirming a right maybe to begin. Um, yeah, for me, but also for everyone, for others, you know. Yeah. So oh, amazing. This is so wonderful to hear the three of you in conversation. And as always, I would love to just let this continue, but we do have several questions from, from viewers that we've brought to you. And if there's time, I have a question of my own that I might like to ask. Um, so one of the questions that came in is for both of you. Uh, they say, I love the metaphor of translation as dance. And then there was a follow-up the same person wrote back and said that something that Tracy said reminded her of, reminded the writer at, of a speech that Toni Morrison gave called The Dancing Mind. So the question is, can you talk about the listening that you find yourself engaged in as you translate? What are the modes of listening you are aware of engaging as a translator? I often feel that listening is the, the mode that drives my work as a writer, at least that's what I tell myself. I am listening to and through um, and trying to find um, what I otherwise am not equipped to notice or to, uh, you know, like it's kind of own up to. And I think that, you know, there's a different kind of listening that's at, at stake here, which is um, what, what is this poem that's bearing its soul what is it offering and what does it want? What does it want me to lean toward? Um, you, you feel that when you're reading a poem and those are the features that, that you, you notice and that you respond to and that you question and dwell upon. Um, when you're reading a, a kind of a literal translation, you, you notice these, those things and you also notice areas where you know something more is there than what you're getting. And that was the kind of listening that I, I found myself daunted by and then really loving to think 
okay, I can, I can recognize these images. I can recognize this logical clause here, but what is the poet really, you know, what is she, what is she confounded by and what is she conjuring by, by bringing these things together? And, and can I leap into that space? Um, sometimes it meant, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to think about the hot spots in this poem and allow them to activate something for me. Um, and sometimes it was allowing my own mind to, to associate a little bit. Um, but those were, the, those were the forms of listening that I was conscious of. And then of course, there's a mode of listening that's like, I'm stuck. This is what I hear, but I can't, what do I do with this? Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, I had recourse to Eli for years of this process and that was great. And then she, you know, she's, she's passed on now. And so thinking what, what, what drives her? What are, what are these other poems obsessed with that have spoken to me? And how can I um, trust that this poem that I'm struggling with is in conversation with those in some way? So some of it is, you know, a kind of inventive or willful form of listening that also ideally gets you to the next thing that's concrete that you can really, really trust. Kate? Yeah, I mean, I think for me in, in bringing listening, um, towards dance, I think, uh, I love dance. I love dancing and I love watching dance. And um, I'm not, but I'm a very amateur uh, dancer, but uh, it's something about rhythm I think is, and I, is, is, is really important to me um, as a writer and, I, and in terms of preference of what one might be drawn to, I think with um, this writer, Ellen Bessette, I think what I, what I find in her is, is this kind of strange, kind of untimely off kind of rhythm, which, um, you know, like when you, if this happens to you, if you like dancing or, you know, when someone is dancing in front of you or dancing well or not well, but with joy or, you know, abandon and, and just sort of catching the energy and wanting to dance. I often, you know, if I'm watching someone dance, I want to dance too, you know, and there's something about that, I think for me that powers or is the energy source of my, my writing and my translation is, is, is sort of reading and, and feeling kind of um, a sort of agitation. It's often a rhythmic agitation, which is as much to do with, as rhythm is to do with kind of delay and spacing as it is to, um, with anything else, the kind of gaps between things that kind of agitates me into wanting to dance to or write to. Um, <laughs> so it is about that, a kind of um, responding, uh, responding with my own energy to the energy that, 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 I, can, that I can hear and it, yeah, and rhythm is, is a crucial part of that, to the point where it's part of life hacks of, you know, um, that Magdalena was asking about, I do, if I'm working and I've been sitting down for a long time, I do, and I'm alone, which is not that often nowadays, but I will just put really loud music on, and dance about for a while. <laughs> And then go back. <laughs> go back to what I was working on. Yeah. So a question has come in that's for you, Kate. That's the perfect follow-up to that one. Um, the, the person says that they especially like the form of this little art. How did you decide to arrange the book? And what do you think its organization can tell us about how we speak about, read about, think about, write, and understand translation and literature? Wow. Thank you for... <laughs> Um, I think just to answer, maybe I could, I could talk for a long, long time if we were together in a different setting uh, to the questioner. Um, I think for me, the key thing was, uh, and it has to do with, um, I guess, a question of authority that, that Tracy mentioned earlier of, of how, uh, which, I, which was troubling to me through my translation process and through the writing process. Who am I? <laughs> who am I to? Who am I to? It was a big issue for me, who am I to translate this work? And then who am I to pronounce on translation um, for others? Uh, not, and and to how to do that in a way that precisely isn't for others, but trying to kind of affirm what was particular to me and try to find ways to open that up in such a way that others might uh, be able to join me uh, or find kind of common ground with me. So the form was very much related to that. I wanted to make an open kind of book where uh, you might, and that's why there is this kind of um, address uh, between a you and a me, uh, uh, or a me and a you, <laughs> um, throughout um, a kind of informality to the book, which was trying to make it um, capacious enough that, you know, a dissenting 
thinker, a dissenting translator could also come in and just occupy that space with me for a while. So um, the organization did very much have to do with rhythm and pacing and trying to, to sort of uh, arrive at a mode of doing argument, of doing argumentation that, that felt um, narrativized and dramatized to the point where when, when I arrive at a question or, or, or a proposition, it, it lands. And I think that it has very much to do with kind of pacing and rhythm, but it also had to do with trying to make space for, um, for others to join me in the common thing, which is uh, the book, which isn't me, you know, the, the thing that's external to me. Uh, we have another question. This one is for Tracy. Did the experience of working with Ile change how you interact with the translators of your own poems? How does being translated feel to you? Hmm. Um, I like that. I, um, after or during, as this project was kind of culminating, um, a Spanish translation of Wait in the Water was beginning and um, I speak Spanish and um, I felt that unlike previous translations, I wasn't afraid. I just wanted to, um, I didn't want to say, okay, I'll let them, I'll let them do this. I'll, I'll answer their questions, but I want it to be their act. Um, the translator, um, Andrea Cote Potero, um, is really wonderful at um, just wanting to kind of like have the relationship with me that I had with Elay in terms of let's talk, what, what are you thinking about? What do you care about? Um, how do you read your poems out loud? And, and um, she's closed the distance between me and, and, and her version of my poems in a way that's felt really beautiful. I think I was probably um, afraid before. Um, the first translations of my work, I think were in languages that I don't speak. And so I just had to trust. Um, and this brought me into an awareness that, oh no, this can be a really kind of a, a, a shared endeavor. Um, and and that's, that's how I've received the, the gift of, of Andrea's work on my work. Um, I don't know what future translations will be like. I met Ile through my Chinese translator um, whom I've never met. Um, but he said, you guys, I know your work and I know her work and you, you need to know one another. Um, and, and that was a really beautiful gift. So I hope I'll, I'll have other relationships like that. And that's an amazing story to think about how, what brought you as a poet and a writer to translation. And, and if I may take the last few minutes that my question I think is mostly directed to Tracy, but anyone's welcome to answer it. But I think in this whole translating the future and thinking about it, it seems like right now there isn't, there's, there aren't as many writers and poets who are finding translation in, in ways, in a way like the way that you have. And I'm just, I think often about how to bring more, more writers into this world that we're in of translation. And I wonder if you have any thoughts well, on your experience. I love the way that this happened. It was kind of like a setup in a way. Um, after Elaine and I had already begun our relationship um, with on her poems, I was invited to a translation workshop that Ming Di conducts in um, China every fall usually. And Elaine came to that. But what usually happens there is writers in, in one language sit across from writers in another language and work on an in, a single poem together or two or three poems over the course of a day um, with help from bilingual people. And so it allows those of us who see ourselves as unlikely translators because we don't have a strong sense of um, authority within, within a, a single language to say, oh, but I can, I can cross this stream. I can, I can do this thing of listening and interpreting and conversing. Um, and I feel like there should just be more, more opportunities for such exchange. Um, I love the, the people who know that this is something they can do, but I love to think that the poets I love in their own language could also become guides for me to, to poetry and other, and other, from other places. Mm -hmm. What, what do you think about that question? Oh. <laughs> or do we have another minute? 
I have 229 on my clock. Oh, okay. <laughs> Kate? I would just say, um, in an extension to what was just said, that I think um, translation is the most extraordinary um, education in many kinds of, into many kinds of things, many kinds of questions, but one of them is writing. Um, and, and, you know, is a kind of making a space, a kind of a, a forum for, for thinking about how writing happens, what it does, how it behaves, you know, I would think, and also a way of affirming um, where I teach, I teach with a lot of, of I teach with, work with artists and they're almost always uh, speaking English as a second or third language um, and trying to use translation as a way of also kind of affirming um, the knowledge in the room, the, the resources in the room, the, um, given that the, the language of instruction is, is English. So that to think of translation as a way, as kind of something that's brought in um, to writing pedagogy, um, not just a kind of a question of, of linguistic competence, but but um, I think it could be brought into so many different fields meaningfully and, and also thinking of younger of children, you know, so much earlier as a way of um, affirming um, and, and exploring competence and field, you know, bodies of knowledge and so on. So I am very, yeah, I'm very pro uh, translation, like opening up translation as a practice for, for more, more of us. Thank you all so much. This has been unforgettable. Um, perfect, wonderful. Thank you, Magdalena, for that great framing and those questions. And Alison has some final thank yous. That was a beautiful moderation, Magdalena. Thank you so much. And once again, we'd like to thank our partners, HowlRound, Pen America, the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, and to the Princeton University Program in Translation and Intercultural Communication for their support of today's event. And thank you all for watching Translating the Future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.